Okay, our next uh, topic is also on participatory breeding, participatory breeding of wheat for organic production. Beautiful picture of bread there. I'm happy to be able to introduce Lisa Kissing-Kusick, who is a um, grad student at Cornell, working with Mark Sorrells and with, with, uh, with um, New York small grains uh, growers in, her, in this project. So, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction to participatory plant breeding, and then I'm going to talk about an in-depth project that involves many different people that you can see here, and institutions and farmers who participated in making selections, um, and nonprofits as well. So to start out with, I'd like to just ask the room real fast to just uh, what, what you think the purpose of plant breeding is. Just say something quick out for everybody to hear. Okay. Feeding people. Feeding people. <laughs> Anyone on. else? Anyone else? Making money. Evolution. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Benefit. Sure. So there's many different objectives, right? And I feel like often as plant breeders, um, we get caught up in these specific objectives and kind of forget the big picture. And so I decided to zoom out kind of 30,000 feet and try to figure it out. And so in my mind, we are looking to improve food systems through plant breeding and specifically through genetic improvements of plants. And this is, I think, what often is in the minds of um, people when they think of plant breeding and plant breeders themselves. But there's two important pieces that are kind of missing to this uh, diagram that first we need to know the needs. We need to know what problems need to be solved before we can actually improve anything genetically and make an impact. And then second, farmers have to adopt our varieties before they can improve food systems and actually make an impact. So I'm here to talk about participatory plant breeding. That's a tool that can help realize those three steps of plant breeding to improve uh, food systems. And I really like a definition given by Salvatore Ciccarelli in a recent paper released last month that looks at participatory breeding in terms of two gradients. So instead of participatory breeding being a method, which is often talked about that it is one single method, it's rather dynamic that it includes different degrees of participation and different degrees of decentralization in a breeding program. And so first, as far as participation goes, um, it defines the, the involvement of clients within a breeding program. And clients can be farmers, they can be consumers, they can be processors, kind of anybody along the food chain that's going to utilize this project or product um, from the breeding program. And first, Participation can be very useful for identifying needs within a breeding program. So we need to find out what needs to be solved or we are wasting our time in making breeding happen. And through interviews, farm transect walks, uh, we can gather information from clients in a breeding program to inform what we actually need to do and what we need to solve through genetic improvement. And then second, um, there is intriguing evidence um, from Salvatore Ciccarelli, again, that farmers can be as effective or more effective than plant breeders at selecting improved genotypes, particularly in conditions <coughs> with a lot of stress or in conditions that are unfamiliar to plant breeders. So if a plant breeder is unfamiliar for organi with organic production, for example, they're probably not going to be as able in finding these superior genotypes as an organic farmer who deals with organic farming every day and knows what they're looking for. Um, but genetic improvement is probably most impacted by participation in finding relevant environments in which to make selections. And farmers can help us do that. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. And then finally, participation is very effective at reducing um, the biggest bottleneck that we often find in breeding programs that 
uh, Adrian just spoke about, which is adoption of these varieties. So adoption is often a bottleneck that we get these great varieties and they don't get adopted by farmers. They don't get out into the marketplace and into fields. And what participation can do is it provides familiarity and trust with the material that's been bred so that farmers see it in their fields or their neighbors' fields and they're more likely to adopt those varieties afterward. And in addition, um, what adoption can do is it can speed up the entire breeding process. So when you have material being selected in a farmer's field, um, that farmer is already evaluating it essentially for yield in their own environment and you can cut the extra years of variety um, of yield trialing which is often three or more years that's necessary after you develop superior lines for release so you can sometimes shave off um, three or more years off of a, a breeding program and get um, varieties in the field faster so decentralization um, I'm gonna walk through um, why I consider decentralization to be important to breeding programs. So here, this background kind of shows us uh, different, a different region, say, that a breeding program is responsible for um, developing varieties. Um, and we have in that far kind of pink corner, perhaps, you know, a different soil type, a sandy soil, or you can have different management happening there. You can have more water availability. You can have more cold, um, higher uh, nutrients, you know, phosphorus or nitrogen availability. And down here we have a different situation. So we generally make selections in a few environments in breeding. And so here this might be our research station in the middle. And so when we develop lines, we're going to pick the best genotypes out of those um, in selection. And so for example, out of five that we evaluated, one is going to be the best here. But the fact is, do we really care uh, what is genetically superior in this one particular space? No. What we care about is all of the surrounding farms that are around there and how those genotypes perform in the farms that are going to produce our food. And so, this is for the plant breeders in the group that want to see the, the equations. I have those in the corner to not scare everyone else. Um, if we have very different environments um, from our selection environment, we're probably going to get a change in performance of genotypes for various traits. And so perhaps our lowest performing genotype in our research plot is going to be the best in another environment. And here as well, we have a change. But the thing is that as breeders, we're going to just pick the best lines and release those. So what decentralization can do is it provides more environments in which we make selections so that we have the best material for many different environments in which farmers are actually going to grow the crops. So participatory breeding is again um, a combination of participation and decentralization and I'll give you some examples of different projects that fall um, along the spectrum in different ways. So first we could have a centralized um, breeding program that um, where you have selection taking place in very few environments and then not much participation from clients in the process. You can have um, the other end of the spectrum which we have examples in France currently in Canada and in Syria um, where you have many many farmers scattered across a wide geographic region that are making selections on their land and participating in, in much of the process. Or you can have things in the middle. So we have some commodity checkoff programs in the United States uh, where we'll say, for example, uh, sugar beets, where sugar beet growers may pay a certain amount of their uh, yields to a, a pool which would fund breeding programs. And those, those farmers on the board of um, the sugar beet growers are going to inform the breeding program, but perhaps it's only happening, um, selection itself is only happening in a centralized location. Or we have an example of um, wheat programs uh, coordinated by, by Cooper in 1997, 
where they found very large um, genotype by environment in interactions, like I talked about with decentralization. And so they scattered their selection sites across many different regions in Australia, um, but they're not involving farmers really in the process. So I get this question all the time um, of how, how do we know this works? We talk about participatory breeding and how great it is, but, but how do we know? And so I got tired of receiving that question and decided to do a little meta-analysis of the literature to, to show that it can work. So first in our, our step of assessing needs for breeding programs, um, clients identify different priority traits than breeding programs were using in um, pretty much all the examples I could find. Um, so the references are there. Second, um, farmer selected lines performed better than top performing check lines in regions or lines selected by um, breeders themselves. And there are many examples here <coughs> from all over the world and many different crops showing that was the case. Third, adoption. Um, this is highly uh, uh, shown in the literature that it uh, the participatory breeding increases adoption and overall diversity of varieties grown in a region that when you have many farmers selecting you're going to get many varieties that are going to be adopted. And then finally lower cost. That there's been less um, evaluation of cost in participatory breeding programs um, but due to primarily the ability to use um, farmer sites and farmer management instead of paying for infrastructure and land and staff to run research stations and do selection that cuts down on costs of these programs quite a bit and moreover um, you have lower cost because you can cut um, years off of um, yield testing at the end of a breeding program and save quite a bit of, of money in, in that regard. So what is the case for organic wheat? Um, so participatory breeding is great. It uh, works in many situations, particularly where you need decentralization because you have high genotype by environmental interactions, um, where you are uncertain about the actual needs of the breeding program. Um, but what, what should we do for wheat? Should we, should we use this method or not? Um, so farmers define different priority traits than conventional growers for wheat in Minnesota. So that was kind of a red flag to begin with. And throughout all of North America, um, there's been very high GBIE demonstrated for protein content and yield in wheat um, between organic and conventional environments. So that's another big red flag. And then even more so, um, there's been really wonderful research in Canada and the US um, and Europe showing that if lines are selected under organic conditions, um, versus conventional conditions and then grown under organic conditions, the ones that were selected under organic environments are going to have consistently higher protein and yield. Um, so that was uh, definitely showing that we need organic environments. Um, but the fact is that uh, it's estimated about 95% of our selection programs are not organic. So what do we do? But this gets to, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, what Adrian talked about, that there's really low economic return for breeding efforts. So we don't have companies that are interested in taking this on. And so our wheat growers overall are, don't have varieties well adapted to their systems. And so they're turning to materials that are probably not optimal for their environments. And then we also have high mistrust of modern wheat breeding. So very in since 2011 or a little bit before, there's been a lot of um, borderline conspiracy theory and borderline like supposition that um, modern wheat is a poison. It's a modern, it's chronic poison. And so you have farmers that don't want to grow it because people don't want to eat it. But with that, you have people growing land races, which is wonderful for diversity, but terrible for yields. And so farmers are not getting the, the optimal product that they could. Um, and so we, 
would like to reestablish trust in breeding programs, and participatory breeding can help do that. So we hit all of our points as to why participatory breeding makes sense, and so we decided to follow a participatory breeding um, program which kind of falls along this spectrum of participation and decentralization. Farmers are involved in most stages of breeding, um, but researchers are also actively engaged in the process. So what does it look like? How, how did we do this? First, uh, I worked with farmers to do interviews to identify barriers and look at their needs in breeding. And then we selected ideal parents according to those needs, made crosses. Um, Julie made a lot of these crosses in the back. <laughs> and then, um, so after making crosses of promising parents, um, we bulked their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren um, until we had enough material to uh, send out to farms. And then when we had enough material, this is an example plot that was um, placed on farms. So each one of these plots is going to have thousands of different genetic combinations, um, great-great-grandchildren from the initial cross. And um, this is replicated twice on each farm. And each farmer got five unique um, crosses, the progeny for five unique crosses, and one Czech variety that's commonly grown in the region to kind of compare to make sure that um, they're getting something better than what they're already using. And then farmers, um, I worked with them to be able to, to flag um, ideal plants that met their ideal characteristics. And then I also um, got that material, and if they're not able to select for something in the field, say protein content, then uh, we took that into the lab and I selected it there. Then we gave them their selected seed the next generation, and then um, F, at F6, the F6 generation will have stable 97% um, homozygous lines that um, we've decided to let the farmers do um, what they want with those lines, and we can facilitate any variety dissemination at that point, but we decided to leave it up to them. So here's uh, a geographic representation of where we're working and how decentralized our program is. So we work in a very wide um, uh, climatic zone from Pennsylvania to Maine. And in parts of Pennsylvania and New York, we get about 30 inches of precipitation. In parts of Vermont and Maine, it's 60 inches. So it's quite a big difference. And um, very, very large difference in minimum temperatures as well. And to identify ideal parents for the selection program, we had three variety trial sites kind of stretched along the gradient of different environments. And then we had 11 farmers participate in selection on their sites. Um, spring wheat is further north and winter wheat is usually further south. So starting um, interviewing 11 farmers, I'm just going to kind of contrast these farmers' reality with the nationwide average for wheat. Um, so as far as farm size goes, we do have a, a pretty big diversity in farm size um, from seven to 1,500 acres. Um, but the amount of wheat that they're growing is quite a bit smaller than the nationwide average. 42 acres of wheat compares to about, I think it's 332 acres per farm, which is the nationwide average for wheat. Um, so not growing as much wheat. And then crop diversity is through the roof compared to the nationwide average for wheat. Um, an average of 17 crops are grown per farm and there's six years rotation um, on average. And as far as farmer experience goes in participatory breeding, it's, it's wise to include experienced farmers, farmers that have um, a lot of knowledge of the crop so that they can identify the best genotypes as they go and make selections. So we definitely included farmers who had a lot of experience, but also um, some beginner farmers uh, were thrown in the mix. And then mar uh, markets, these farmers are selling their wheat uh, to, to local and regional mills and growers, CSAs, and selling seed, which is very different than the nationwide average, which is largely um, exporting commodity wheat to international markets. And then a big difference is that 72% of these farmers use straw in their wheat for livestock, either they're on their farm or for neighbors. And that's a big difference um, from what we've been typically doing um, in serving uh, farmers around the nation. 
So as far as barriers go, this is a bit hard to read, I apologize. Um, we tried to see what is keeping them from meeting their goals and growing wheat on their farm, and can we address this through plant breeding or not? And luckily, in the pink here, these are barriers that can be addressed through plant breeding. So we can do, um, we can do something here. So winter kill, we control fusarium lodging and dehulling, we can all address. I am running out of time. Um, so I think this is one of the most fascinating pieces of the work we've done so far. So we have here um, farmers rate, rated their priority traits. They could rate up to five and then they ranked them in order of importance. And everybody's turning their heads like this. Um, and I have this for winter wheat and spring wheat. And I just want to highlight that in red here, these are characteristics that are actually negatively correlated to what conventional like wheat breeding programs are selecting for. So we're selecting for short wheat, for um, wheat that does well in monoculture that's generally very erect in habit and that can tolerate general fertilizer requirements, um, which are usually fairly high. And then um, yield and high protein, we saw there's G by E crossover between organic and conventional systems. And then um, we have not evaluated most of our varieties for artisanal baking quality and flavor, and that is of high interest to organic growers. So how our process works, we evaluated 146 varieties um, to select ideal parents, analyzed 37 of those um, for quality, and then seven varieties um, for artisanal baking, and then those seven varieties for sensory quality. And so here, this looks messy, but it's actually um, pretty easy to see. So we have test weight over here and yield, and then um, fusarium, we're looking for blue dots, and we're looking for large circles, which would not have much lodging in parents. So the parents, the varieties that are kind of in this region and are gonna be blue with large circles are gonna be ideal parents. And so here, this is warthog. The text didn't show up very well right here, but um, we include it as a parent because um, it's uh, quite, uh, quite excellent for the characteristics farmers are looking for. Spring wheat is a little different um, scenario that we have, um, we're looking for tall height and tall yield and low lodging, and nothing really exists in this region here that would have all of those characteristics. So most of our tall varieties lodge quite a bit and have low yield, um, and most of our high yielding varieties are short. So we picked some that are kind of intermediate. So we did um, Glen here, this is AC Berry, and then Red Fife up there to see if we can get something that might have um, everything farmers are looking for. And then as far as baking evaluation goes, um, we have some, some great varieties like Glen, Warthog, um, that had really um, overall good baking and then tall, um, tall breads that were produced that bakers like. And then as far as sensory evaluation, um, Red Fife was, um, was a winner in terms of taste intensity and complexity. It had statistically um, more earthy flavors associated with it. Um, and Glen as well was, was quite good for crumb and, um, and uh, crust structure. So then after we made these crosses from our promising parents and then put out um, the F, F4, um, in this case, uh, generation on farm, um, weed competitive ability was the number one priority trait for farmers with um, spring wheat. And I did a, a literature review to see what traits were um, most correlated with weed competitive ability. And it turns out that um, we could select for individual plants between the three and five leaf stage that had very wide leaves and a spreading habit and a lot of ground cover. And so we had farmers space plant the um, their plots so that they could identify individual plants and they went to flag the best um, early vigor varieties um, at, that, at that stage. And then um, fusarium tolerance was um, a very important trait for most farmers, um, but as far as participatory breeding goes, selecting under on-farm conditions for um, disease is, is not recommended generally. That, that is one thing that plant breeders uh, ha are generally more adept at identifying is weed pr uh, disease presence. And 
also we don't want to inoculate farmers fields with diseases uh, to have uniform conditions so we have a fusarium headlight nursery at Cornell where we'll be evaluating the F3 lines um, this year uh, for incidence and severity of disease so that we can select the most tolerant varieties and then as far as protein goes uh, we're quite lucky to be getting a machine at Cornell uh, that can identify a single kernel protein content non-destructively. So once farmers collect the, the material from each plot that meets their agronomic characteristics, we get that and then I can select the 50% highest protein seed to give back to them. And it is a heritable trait, so we can increase the protein quality. And then as far as um, height and lodging, this is our first data kind of showing um, changes in population over time. So this compares random um, selected material from one plot to what farmers selected, and they are selecting for taller plants, which is consistent with what we thought. And then as far as lodging goes, I did another literature review to see what was correlated with, with lodging and easily measurable. And it turns out the diameter of the stem is correlated. So um, I went with a caliper at the end of the season when we harvested and when the, the I had the farmers rip out the plant they liked and then um, I selected the ones with the largest diameter stem. And so again, random versus um, <coughs> selected, we have larger stems and I'm done. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Questions? I had one minute, so I'll just do this real fast. So um, I did a review on um, wheat sensitivity among different species and um, genotypes of wheat. And einkorn is quite promising in terms of celiac disease uh, for having low levels of these very reactive um, epitopes and then um, in vitro and in vivo reactivity in people. And so we also have a, an einkorn um, program on farm and on research station. Uh, and we're selecting for um, ease of being able to dehull it because einkorn comes in the hull. That's what makes it really difficult. And so we're, we're trying to find easy um, threshing and um, dehulled einkorn. Yeah. 